It is time, as I say, to turn to our Skullduggery Hall of Fame as a result of the cricket scandal in Australia. If you've somehow missed this, or you're not up to speed, basically, on what happened in the Australian cricket scandal, it revolves around two main characters, Steve Smith and Cameron Bancroft. Here's a quick explainer of what's been going on. We have as a captain, uh, and at least one of our players, are cheats. Simple Correct. as that. So how can, how can Steve Smith go out there in half an hour's time and captain the Australian cricket team if he's a cheat. Well, as to what happens in this test match, that who know, who cares, really? Uh, you've even got the Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, who's, who's basically saying this beggars belief and we need decisive action. Have a look. And bitterly disappointed. How can our team be engaged in cheating like this? It, it beggars belief. It's about the most passionate I've ever seen Malcolm Turnbull about anything. Yeah. <laughs> and I tell you, there is an element of, of an overreaction about this, isn't there? Can you imagine Leo Varadkar getting involved in some sort of like, um, I don't know, a League of Ireland game that was bent or something like that, and saying <laughs> this is not, this is not on, like you know, the, the, it should be played in the in, in the proper way. Well, imagine if Leo came out last year and condemned Jim Gavin and Dublin footballers for pulling down all the Mayo players. He would be slated, wouldn't he, for blatant populism. Um, I'm not sure what the Aussie guy is like, but... Uh, it's, be it's because of the sport, though, as well. That yeah. cricket is uh, viewed as this gentlemanly thing where you are supposed to show decorum to your opponent. Yeah. You're playing with each other rather than against each other. It, it's all nonsense, though. Like, you know, yeah. I have done a bit of reading into it. Nick Royal... Um, is a friend of mine who, who writes about cricket and uh, he, he was covering the Ireland game but he, he was basically saying this is all nonsense this stuff goes on all the time and I was just reading about it like you can kind of technically you can kind of spit on the ball and use saliva on the ball but you can't use saliva say if you have like a mint or mm. like something in your mouth and um, this actually goes back to a game I think Australia were playing only a few years ago where they were kind of sinned against by something a little bit similar but probably wasn't but I think they really do have the remorse of like um, I suppose the boyfriend who was caught <laughs> do you know what I mean it's like I'm not really sure you're that sorry here like but as I was saying before the show I do think it'll it will set a bit of a template in terms of cheating in cricket because if there's such a backlash to it, maybe there won't be such a kind of willingness to engage in this stuff again. Um, but ultimately, I don't know, we're talking about cricket, I suppose. Yeah, ultimately. <laughs> Let, let's give a couple of other examples. As I say, this is our Skullduggery Hall of Fame. And the first inductee to our off-the-ball Skullduggery Hall of Fame is Rahul Dravid. And we are staying with cricket. Uh, we'll show you this uh, piece of video, I think. Uh, as you say, you're not allowed to uh, use your saliva on a ball if you have uh, like a lozenge in your mouth, but he's actually using a well-sucked lozenge to actually add kind of a, a sticky substance to the ball, which presumably uh, just makes it kind of more top-heavy, adds a little bit more spin to it, adds some sort of aerodynamic advantage to the bowler. We can see it there again, Rahul Dravid. So basically, this he polished the ball in 2004, with the, the well-stuck lozenge, as I said, but he hasn't officially been charged with the crime, I don't think. So, like, th this is just like roughing up the ball, apparently, tampering with the, I guess, the, the string in the ball and stuff like that. So, it all seems just that, there, as I say, a sport filled with decorum, you kind of twist the rules a little bit, and I guess it is, a, to be fair, it is a sport of fine margins. Oh, it, oh, I'm sure it makes a huge difference as well, you know, for the batsman or whatever, but... Um Nick was making the point that the, the, this notion of it being a gentleman's game is is kind of bogus like and it was like back in the old imperial days it was a way for the English to sort of um, you know make the natives a bit more I suppose British maybe and just more you know proper and whatever but this is going back for years has been skullduggery um, massive betting um, you know scandals in cricket as well uh, and by all accounts cheating is, has been has been um, rife for years in some shape or form so um I've never played the sport, um, but I imagine if if you're if the ball is being thrown at you at eighty miles an hour or whatever, you know, if there's a little bit of a deviance, it's going to make a huge difference. One hundred percent. As you say, though, it is cricket, and we're going to park the cricket examples there. And our next inductee into the Skullduggery Hall of Fame is Don Low Cusack. Here is an extract from his autobiography talking about his skullduggery when it comes to slitters. So he said in his book, there was already a bit of history between Cork and Tip with regard to slitters. They won a penalty against us. So when Kelly stepped up and we had a plan. Once we had been awarded a penalty or we had given away a penalty, we were to create a bit of a commotion, a diversion through which to get the ball in. If we won a penalty, so they had pre-prepared balls basically. If we won a penalty, we'd be getting rid of the O'Neill's ball and getting one of our favourite Cummins all-star balls into use. 
So if we conceded a penalty, he'd be getting that ball in, blah, 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 blah. So on this day, Kelly picked up the dud ball. It had been a job of work from one of our men to soften it up and still have it look like a newish O'Neill's ball. So he says he never handed it in, it just rolled in and it just appeared in front of Owen Kelly before he would take the penalty. And as uh, Don Logue says there, gave him great confidence to see him pick it up. And I guess it's more of a mental thing as well as anything that you know that we've got the control of this small controllable, which... I guess they've outlawed it's, it's in the fine, end. Uh, sport is fine margin. It really is at the top level. Um, I had to laugh at the Paul Pessy Scalido uh, tweet, I think it was last night, where he was on about playing under Neil Warnock. And Neil Warnock said, let's go for a game of bowling, lads. And um, let's actually, let's, let's, let's throw in like £10 into the pot and whoever, whoever um, wins the, whoever, I don't know, whatever win, whoever wins the bowling game. But Neil Warnock came out and he produced his own like kind of signature ball like and basically bowled them out, won, won, won the bowling game and took 250 quid. But what did you make of the, um, I was just thinking of this, what did you make of the incident last year where the fi- you know the free kick, the final kick of the game in the All-Ireland Final and you have the thing tossed at uh, the kicker by Keegan, um, which, you know, it, it would have is, is, is that totally out of order? I think it is. Yes. But that's trying to get your edge as well. And he didn't care that it was going to be caught on TV. He was just the, the act of desperation. I don't imagine it was pre-planned uh, or anything. No, the problem with Keegan is that he was unsuccessful. He will be in our <laughs> Hall of Fame this morning if he had actually succeeded. If you want to cheat, Lee, do it right. Do it right, do exactly. It right. And don't get caught, preferably. Two things, do it right and don't get caught. He wouldn't have got caught. That was kind of retrospective stuff, wasn't it? That kind of caught Lee Keegan. Although, that being said, if the ball had moved or whatever, then he probably would have got caught. So it would have been some... Um, so I'm looking back into the incident anyway on the part of Dublin. Yeah, ba- so basically Lee Keegan needs to achieve two more things in his career. Win an All-Ireland medal and get himself into the Off the Ball Hall of Fame for Skullduggery, which hopefully he will. And get back fit. Get back fit as well, Well, hopefully that'll be kind of mm. a, a means to an end of winning the All-Ireland. But we're going we're to change to, from balls now to actually tampering with your equipment. And uh, specifically we're going to start with a sword here in fencing. So Boris Onyschenko is this former modern pentathlete. And we're going to play you this video here of Jim Fox. Uh, a British pentathlete explaining the situation. I think he's going to start talking in just a moment when he actually explains what Onischenko did to his sword to make this thing so effective. So what could he possibly do to a fencing sword is, uh, is my automatic question. We can see him. Here we go. And subsequently, what happened is it was found that these two wires here that are insulated and have, have to be all the way up to the, to the plug they they were been tampered with and uh, apparently he had something on his finger where he could close the two weapons and this would cause the light to come on. So that is Jim Fox there explaining what is essentially the means to an end that is you can decide when you will make the buzzer go, when you can decide whether or not the judges see that you've actually hit your man and that you will score a point in this system. So Jim Fox fell victim to this. Onishchenko didn't hit him with a sword, but he ended up losing the bout as a result of this. And he was like, something's going on here. I need to figure this thing out. And as we could see there uh, from AP, he actually did a, a little bit of an explainer on the sword. Do you reckon Jim didn't. thought he'd ever be on Off the Ball AM? I presume, I'd say he probably had dreams, but I don't think he mm. would have been, it wouldn't have been possible for him to dream that big. So that he might actually be live on, on Facebook and YouTube in years to come. Um, so that's one thing in terms of equipment that you could use. The other thing now, and this is apparently more notorious than this, I think the fencing thing was just weird and just one of these strange technological uh, caveats that were available. But Sammy Sosa was a former baseball player with the Chicago Cubs and he had a corked bat. Now, if you don't know what a corked bat is, well, let me show you this video from 2003. This is what happens when, if you, if you hit a corked bat with a ball too hard, You'll see it now in just a moment, the evidence of his cork bat when the officials go over to pick the thing up. Sammy Sosa are running around there pretending nothing has happened and there we go, absolutely shattered. Basically a cork bat is a lighter bat which you replace the inside with basically a cork, the same material at the top of a champagne bottle. It allows for a lighter swing, it allows for better aerodynamics and it allows for better performance in baseball, of course completely outlawed and he did himself in there when that shattered. Interestingly though, there was a study carried out in 2007 that found that corked bats absorbed more kinetic energy than uncorked bats. So basically didn't hit the ball any further as a result. So this was all pointless. So Sammy Sosa of the Chicago Cubs, uh, your efforts were all for nothing. Well, he also was doing his bit to, um, you know, I guess a little, a little bit of uh, 
science into the sport and you just see see how we can improve or we can basically rule things out of actually improving the bat, you know, yeah. unwittingly. Sammy Sosa, what a name though. What a name is yeah. right. And uh, he's also very welcome to the, to our Off the Ball Hall of Fame of Skullduggery. Another man who we're very welcome, who is very welcome into our Hall of Fame is Muhammad Ali. He, of course, there, there's, there's a numerous efforts of Skullduggery against Muhammad Ali. Uh, there is one very famous effort by Muhammad Ali to instigate some skullduggery. It was against Henry Cooper in 1963. Have a look at this. So this is a pretty famous fight. That is that's the third or fourth round, the penultimate round of the fight anyway. Ali is completely spent, sits down at his corner, and you can just about make it out here, but uh, his coaches accidentally, let's say, tear his glove. So what happens when you tear your glove in a professional boxing bout? Well, the referee has to give you an extra 20 seconds or so of a break. And after that unbelievable left hook from Henry Cooper there in 63, probably could have done with that 20 seconds. That was fairly benign though, wasn't it? For, for, well, uh, it, it, I, I, I let him away with that. What, what, do you remember Moe in The Simpsons when Dredrick Tatum was fighting Homer and Moe like, produced these gloves that had like barbed wire on yes. them? <laughs> that, that, that'd that be a different walk-in. <laughs> no. Well, th there is talk of Ali and... Um, who, who was Ali fighting? One of, one of his earliest fights. And there was talk that he had got poison on his gloves, his opponent's gloves, uh, against Ali. And it forced Ali into kind of more of a submission than he had wanted to, which obviously is far more severe than this. This basically just bought Ali a bit of time. Of course, he comes out in this round and knocks Cooper out. Cooper gets that famous cut. He, he, he was famous for cutting, of course. I guess 20 seconds is a long time and when you, what did you get, a minute? Yeah, something like Another that. I'm, I'm not sure what it was. When you're, when you're a punch drunk, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's huge. It's, it's So, Muhammad Ali, you're very welcome as well uh, to our Hall of Fame. There's only a couple of more ones before we get into a few racing examples. I'm it's, actually wondering about what, what we can introduce now in sports for the next Hall of Fame segment on this show. We, can, we have to come up with innovative ideas in terms of cheating. Well, as I say, GPS. Make that GPS yeah. hit the ball. Make that GPS successful. Yes. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of horse racing. Like, as I say, there's some brilliant racing ones, which we'll get to in just a moment. I've got a few ideas for those as well. You, you've really worked on this. Well, a lot of energy into it. Huge amount of the morning. I'm, I'm very exercised about this. Most prep you've done for a show in a while, let's say. Ever, I would yeah, say. Ever. Yeah, the, 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 the only prep I've ever done for any <laughs> show, really. Let's welcome the Sacramento College Class of 2002 to the Off the Ball Skullduggery Hall of Fame. This is from the Associated Press on November 15, 2002. Football players from Sacramento State are accused of greasing their jerseys with nonstick cooking spray on the sideline during a game against top-ranked Montana last weekend. The Big Sky Conference in Sacramento State said they were trying to figure out how many applied PAM, which is a cooking spray, to their uniforms, and if the coaches knew the players in the university could face punishment. We'll decide the penalty, and depending upon who we find at the bottom of the pile, Doug Fullerton, the league commissioner, said, I think it's a serious ethical breach. Fullerton said applying cooking spray to a jersey could make it more difficult for opposing linemen. No shit, Mr. Fullerton. Uh, the fact that they actually lost the game is probably the best part about that. So, uh, Sacramento College class of 2002, you're very welcome. That, that's actually a notorious one. Yeah. Basically, uh, lubing yourself up, for lack of a better term. <laughs> Here is uh, a story of uh, George St. Pierre. all happening this morning. All happening this morning. George St. Pierre, uh, this is back in uh, 2009. He was up against BJ Penn. So apparently St. Pierre's cornerman, Phil Nurse, rubbed Vaseline on his back and shoulders in between rounds. So the commissioner in Vegas freaked out when they saw it and took the Vaseline from St. Pierre's corner. And following the fight, Penn's camp filed a formal complaint. There's still a lot of loose ends right now, and there still are, I confirm, just doing a bit of a uh, deep dive into this. The MMA community seems completely divided on this, but uh, it's not the first time an opponent accused St. Pierre of being extra slippy. Yeah, I, I just think this show for so early in the morning, we've so much innuendo going on here. But I, do you know what just came into my head there? Finn Harris played Drada last year. Finn Harris played Dundalk last year. Now they were talking about lubing and all this. Finn Harris played Dundalk last year. And Finn Park looked like it was being cut for silage. It was, the pitch was an absolute disgrace. And clearly, they did it because they were playing Dundalk, who were a superior football team. They turned the pitch into a as I say, a field that was being cut for silage. It was a shocking bad game. It was live on TV. And they what lost, was the result? They lost the game. But they'd narrowed that gap and they found that extra you know, percentage to narrow the gap against superior opponents. Is there more to these floodlight stories in the League of Ireland? 
Is there like a, an element of teams, you know, saying we're not um, really, we're not fully fit? Certainly, floodlights have um, not, not not necessarily in the League of Ireland. Certainly, floodlights have dramatically failed before when a bet was going awry or, or all that. Like, and um, but I think the floodlight situation in the League of Ireland is more to do with it being just the greatest league in the world, and a few bulbs are missing. Sometimes about a third of them in mm. United Park, but United Park is now back. They played the aforementioned Harps last night. I had a bet on the game uh, that Finn Harps wouldn't lose the game. They lost the game. Um, because one of their players was on the line, I believe, and rather than let the ball go in, he handled it. And I'm like, you're giving away a penalty, you're going to get sent off. Would you not be better let the ball go in and go 1-0 down? You actually would be, yeah. instead of giving away a penalty, which will likely be a goal, and you're down to 10 men after half an hour. Yeah. And I lost the bet as well. Well, I'm very sorry to hear that. Yeah. Uh, ho hopefully your Cheltenham winnings and the, w the winnings that we shared in as well will keep you kind of above the line for the time were being. There, were there, I actually can't remember. Hopefully there were a few winners. I can remember yeah. feeling vaguely happy at a certain time. And I, I can remember thinking, actually, that was a good tip from Johnny. Uh, I had a producer from this show who, who will remain, a certain Tommy R, shall we yeah. say. Yeah. And I'm not going to extrapolate. T Rooney, this. T we'll say. Beautiful Owen. He, he, he was texting me on the Friday when I had a million things to do, and I mean a million things to do, about the each way terms with a certain bookmaker for an anti post bet. I was like, Tommy, he, was, he lost the bet as well. Actually. Did he? And was he in the wrong, or was the, the bookmaker in the wrong? And Kevin Kilban was involved as well. I'm sorry to mention you, Kev, but he was. This was a day after he backed a, a, a sweep of Irish winners at 150 to 1 which was foiled in the last race. Oh, God. But Tommy and Kevin were done on the old each-way anti-post terms because it was like five places rather than four. And, um, but I had nothing else to do that day, Tommy, if you're listening. That's what you call an amateur mistake, mm. Tommy and Kevin, right there. Uh, there's just three more uh, examples here. We've already showed you this one, but if you didn't join us at the start of the show, we may as well show it to you again. It's Roberto Rojas with Chile. He was, this is phenomenal. It is. He, he was banned <laughs> for life as a result of this. But he actually got somebody from the crowd to throw a firework onto the pitch and pretend he was hit by said firework, but instead he produced a blade from, I don't know, under his jersey and cut himself with this blade, all for the sake of getting a game called off in the hope that they would qualify for the World Cup. He failed miserably, he got banned for life, and, and Chile got banned from the 90s. Getting a bit high and mighty there, own now, in fairness. Well, I'm not so sure. I, I think I can take the moral high ground you when can. you've instructed somebody from the crowd to throw a firework at you. <laughs> and when they've missed, you said, oh, I may as well just go ahead and... Uh, go, resort to plan B but as we showed earlier on you will see the evidence of this here as the camera pans around and that is what you call going above and beyond the line of duty to get yourself into the off the ball Skullduggery Hall of Fame so you're very welcome to the Hall of Fame Roberto Rojas it's good to have you here first installment yeah exactly mm. our penultimate one and this is one of my favourite ones actually is Maurice Garan he is involved in the Tour de France or he was involved in the Tour de France in something like 1904. I think we'll bring the image up on screen here. So this is from the QI website. In the 1904 Tour de France, 13 riders were disqualified, including the first four across the line and even the eventual winner received a warning. Various misdemeanors were responsible. Some of the racing took place at night and it was alleged that some of the riders were towed from a car with a wire fitted to a piece of cork which they held between their teeth. Maurice Garan was the first man to cross the finishing line but was later disqualified after it was discovered he had gone part of the way by train. Oh, so congratulations Garan and welcome to the Hall of Fame. But also this one, his main rival fell from his bike fast asleep after being fed a chicken leg containing a concealed sleeping pill and other competitors were hindered by having laxatives put in their water bottles, itching powder in their jumpers and sandpaper in their shorts. So if you think the Australian cricketers are the first people to utilise some sort of homemade sandpaper, well the Tour de France in 1904 got there before you. That's good old fashioned cheating in the Tour de France. It's good that cheating is a lot more refined in cycling now. Exactly. La Lance Armstrong, have a look at Maurice Garand. That's how you do cheating and that's how you do it well. And finally, for me anyway, before we get into some of the racing examples, is Terence Rees and Boris Shapiro. They're a joint addition to our Skullduggery Hall of Fame and they played bridge. Yes, bridge. So one of the world's great card playing scandals could be resolved after more than 40 years with the revelation that one of the players involved confessed to cheating. So what happened was that two leading bridge players from Britain, uh, Reese and Shapiro, were caught signalling to each other in the 1965 World Championship. The scandal shook the image of British as a nation which believed in fair play and led to a year-long inquiry by Sir John Foster QC for the British Bridge League. The investigation cleared both players, but the verdict was never accepted. But now a close friend of Reese said the player confessed to him but told it was all part of an experiment to prove cheating was possible, doing it for the common good. So David Rex Taylor, a publishing executive, said that he confided in the 1960s he'd been planning to write a highly researched in-depth book on cheating at the cards and other indoor events. He was banned from the game, or both men were banned for the game, 
and uh, Reese, who died in 1996, never returned to the World Championship stage. So what they used to do basically was look at each other and say for a two of hearts, they'd go like this, or a two of diamonds, they'd go like this, and they had different sort of uh, signals like that. And to be honest with you, if you're going like this across the table to your mate in bridge, I'm probably going to think that something's up, but yeah. clearly they got away with it for a certain amount of time. A less clandestine you know, version of that who wants to be a millionaire when he had the person in the audience kind of giving him the signals for mm. the, uh, the right answers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, before we move on, just briefly on, on the horse racing, like I've seen painted horses, I've seen Happy Valley in Hong Kong as a race course where horses were shot with tranquilizers and darts. Uh, uh, racing is made for this sort of skullduggery, really. Part Gay of Future charm. is the one. Gay Future was a great one in the 70s. I think there was a movie made about this, actually, where... Um, a fairly roguish owner placed uh, this horse who was um, ostensibly gay future into uh, trebles with two other horses who in, in, in the completely hopeless treble that bookmakers took all over, I don't know if it was London or all the bookmakers took the treble because it was just, if you looked at the form it was like, it was the equivalent of having a bet on Carlo to win the football, um, say, um, awfully to win the hurling All-Ireland and some other hopeless bet this year, it can't happen. But two of them were non-runners, and the third horse was actually sort of replaced with a different horse. And the phone line at Cartmel Racecourse was kept constantly busy, which again evokes recollections of uh, Barney Curley's um, Bellustown uh, coup as well. Um, so the horse was actually trained in Ireland. The horse that was supposed to be running wasn't, and uh, the horse won. Um, unfortunately, um, the one mistake they made was the two non-runners were found to be still in their, in their basically grazing in the field. So it was they, they, the rules were actually um, sort of bent in that case. So British bookmakers didn't pay out. Um, and we also had a, an incident in recent years where a horse, and there was a big, uh, the, the, the Fox Rock case, now all connections were, were actually um, exonerated. Um, but the horse seemingly lost two shoes. Um, so when he came back into the parade ring, um, he'd he'd lost two shoes in a race in which he was an eye catcher. But it, and the, it, this is a, a mad case because Michael McDowell represented Ted Walsh, um, Judge Tony Hunt. This is around the Dwyer case at that time, and Aidan O'Brien and Willie Mullins were character references. So it must be one of the the, the biggest. Um, kind of celebrity case in turf club history but they had video footage which showed the shoes but they couldn't prove that the shoes didn't fall off um, after that kind of in, in the parade ring and, and all connections were um, absolved of any blame but um, our racing's great for that crack you know.